Thank you, Nick. Uh, among the many things uh, I have been described as lately in Indian newspapers is a businessman. Uh, if only, uh, is all I can say. I think they got the wrong, uh, wrong M in, in their description. Anyway, Nita Ambani, uh, Your Excellencies, uh, Mukesh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Modi, friends. Um, I had a very pleasant task of introducing Nita Ambani. Uh, the only difficulty is I have to do it in a very short time. Uh, and I don't think I'll be able to describe all the things she has achieved. Uh, in the First of all, let me start at the beginning. She's a very accomplished Bharatanatyam dancer. Now, that is the most difficult thing to be accomplished at. That when you go to start early in your childhood and keep away working at it all your life. So that is, that is a stupendous achievement which I'm going to do. She has uh, done many things. Uh, f obviously, one of the big things she's done is devoted her time to education, both in the Dhirubhai Ambani school, as well as a number of schools across uh, rural uh, Gujarat uh, on behalf of the Reliance uh, Education Program. She has uh, done miracles in the environmental uh, sort of uh, improvement of uh, Jamnagar and, and, and the surrounding areas. Uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, she's a, a, a as it were, the head of uh, Reliance Foundation, which is a charity that comes with environment, education, and development. And last but not the least, cricket, uh, uh, IPL. Uh, uh, and you know, she, she has this uh, uh, iconic uh, Mumbai team, uh, which I'm sure uh, we have all watched with great pleasure. And no doubt, once again, they will get on uh, and the flannels, etc., in April, and we shall watch uh, the next series of IPL. It's a great pleasure to uh, welcome Nita Ambani to give the inaugural C plus J Modi Narayanan lecture at the London School of Economics. What I'm going to do, she will give the lecture, and then uh, questions should be submitted in written form to me, and she will answer a few questions. And I take it that, uh, given this is the LSE, nobody is going to ask silly questions. Thank you. Lord Nicholas Stern, Lord Meghnath Desai, Mr. Shandy Modi, faculty and students of the London School of Economics, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor for me to be at the London School of Economics, a leader amongst intellectual powerhouses. 16 Nobel laureates from a single institution is absolutely dazzling, an incredible feat for any institution in the world. Many great souls have walked the corridors of this wonderful institution which has given the world inspiring leaders, one amongst them being India's 10th president, Dr. K. R. Narayanan. Dr. Narayanan, sprung from the grassroots and grew up in the dust and heat of our land and represented the common man. Another iconic figure associated with this great institution is Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar, the main architect of the Indian Constitution. The service of these great sons of India to the cause of social justice, especially equality and dignity of the Dalits, has been truly invaluable. Mr. Modi, remembering and respecting one's parents are values very dear to my heart. My warm congratulations to you for initiating this PhD fellowship lecture series in the name of your mother Champaben and Father Jamnadas Bhai Modi. 
who are here with us today. Lord Stern, Lord Desai, you are adored in India, both by the academic and the business communities for your incisive insights and mercurial minds. I'm also delighted to see this gathering of young stars in the audience today. It is indeed a momentous day for me as I stand before you to deliver the inaugural Modi Narayanan lecture. I do hope the fellows of the PhD program study India more deeply and extensively and provide the world with new knowledge of this great country. India is reinventing itself and the Indian Renaissance is rapidly becoming a powerful phenomenon a phenomenon which I believe will be based on equity and ethics, a phenomenon which will inspire the world and which will be led by its burgeoning youth. India, with a population of over a billion, is going to get younger in the future. Its youths, the young stars, are raring to go with tremendous confidence their new energy is the engine of India's growth story. I'm proud to represent my country here and take you through its fascinating journey of resurgence. Friends, I'm not an economist, but I hope to do justice to this exciting and a globally enthralling topic as a proud Indian. Ladies and gentlemen, around the 16th century, India and China together constituted 55% of the world economy. But colonization, bureaucracy, and the self-imposed sanctions on their Indian mindset brought this down to single-digit levels. And they remained at these levels for a long time. But that is the story of the past. India is now changing and regaining its luster. It is coming of age and is at the cusp of a radical transformation. The nation's economy is growing at a trailblazing rate of around 8 to 9% per annum and promises to do so for many years to come. We will soon be the fastest growing economy in the world. And which is that decisive event that made this possible? 24th July 1991 marked the dawn of the new era for India. This was the day when our Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, who was then our Finance Minister, stood up in the Parliament and delivered the historic speech which laid down the new industrial policy, a game changer that integrated an isolated economy with the global economy. It broke the binding shackles and freed the aspirations of Indians. If 1947 was the first freedom, to my mind, 1991 was the second freedom, our economic freedom. Freedom to unleash our entrepreneurship and to compete in the world. Freedom to determine our own destiny. In the late 70s and early 80s, when Mukesh and I met, India was considered a third world country. It has been fascinating to see this journey from a third world country to the third most powerful country in the world. <laughs> India's advantages can be summarized by the three Ds, democracy, diversity, and demographics. 
the real explosion will happen when the fourth D of discipline will get integrated. Discipline will bind the country and will align it in its pursuit of becoming a truly advanced economy. Friends, we all have a big dream for India. It has the potential to become a staggering 30 to 40 trillion dollar economy by 2040. And when this dream does come true, then India will be poverty free in the next few decades. This will be India's third and real freedom, freedom from poverty. I believe this is possible. Possible if we energize our youths and build an ecosystem of institutions that provides an opportunity to realize their full potential. I know that most of these are forecasts for the future. A future that will be invented by redefining the present based on the wisdom of the past. A future that will be crafted by you, my young friends. Mukesh often talks about our rights to win. India has now earned its rights to win. People speculate that this century will be Asia's century. In my heart of hearts, I know that India will lead the way. It will not only lead the way, but also be a shining example and show the path to the rest of the world. While the world is still reeling under the aftermaths of the financial crisis, India has come out stronger and has demonstrated that financial innovation cannot be done at the cost of the common man. India is evolving a new and a unique development model which will differentiate it from the rest of the world. India's unique strength lies in its soft power. The soft power will be central to making it a superpower. The economic power will dovetail the emotional power. Soft power is one of those things that are difficult to define, but easy to understand. It is that superior attribute or quality because of which a nation is not only admired, but respected. No doubt it rests on the foundations of material prosperity and well-being. Freedom from poverty is the first prerequisite for any progressive society. However, the real and durable appeal of soft power comes from the value system of the society. The Bhagavad Gita teaches us to do our karma without the attachment to its fruits and results. These ancient values have universal relevance and eternal appeal. Soft power appeals to the heart and the soul in a way that hard power never can. It is this soft power that will help India emerge as a superpower by conquering the hearts and winning the minds. The soft power that will have its roots in its institutions of excellence. Friends, we have realized the national importance of building sustainable institutions of excellence. We understand that excellence is not a competence or ability. Excellence arises from excellent minds. Excellence is an attitude, a mindset. I have been extremely fortunate to have been influenced by two men who personify excellence, my father-in-law, Dhirubhai Ambani, and my husband, Mukesh Ambani. I was fortunate to be a part of the team which built the Reliance Jamnagar Refinery, a truly world-class asset. 
My role was to make the development process people-centric and infuse a soul in this new creation. My role was also to ensure that excellence is ingrained in this asset that will serve India and its people for a long time. But I think my most important job was to build an oasis on this arid land of Jamnagar. The annual rainfall there was less than 400 millimeters a year. Groundwater was scarce and untraceable. But these challenges could not curtail our ambitions. We have created one of the biggest green belts spanning over 1,800 acres. We have planted over 2 million trees. Part of the desert now is Asia's largest mango growing orchard. <laughs> Today, the refinery not only exports petroleum products, but also exports mangoes. <laughs> Rainfall has doubled in this area. Migratory birds such as flamingos and pelicans now fly in this area from far and wide. In huge numbers, resident birds and animals are in abundance. Jamnagar has become a fascinating story of ecological transformation. I have learned a lot in my journey so far. But building the Mumbai Indians cricket team in the Indian Premier League was a new and a tough challenge. I took charge of the team when the team's performance had to be turned around and its true potential had to be unlocked. This last year has taught me a great deal about the human spirit, about perseverance, about teamwork and about excellence. It has reinforced the fact that pursuing excellence gets you closer to perfection. I drilled in the same message to my team. Chase excellence and results will follow. And what better example than Sachin Tendulkar, the greatest cricketer in the world. His sincerity and dedication never fails to amaze me. Mumbai Indians is slowly but surely climbing the ladder of excellence. Mumbai Indians were turning out to be mission impossible to be. It's not going to be easy to beat uh, the Mumbai Indians. We are now expanding our sports vision through the IMG Reliance Joint Venture. It is a world-class initiative in sports development. 29 most deserving young sports stars have been identified from small towns and villages across India and have been sent for a one-year scholarship to the IMG Academy in Florida. This joint venture will also build the most advanced sports infrastructure in the country. Most importantly, it will groom the future champions of India. Friends, we are aware of the challenges that India faces as it transcends into the developed world. There is a development divide. There is a nutrition divide. There is an energy divide and there is a knowledge divide. Illiteracy is the biggest hurdle obstructing the gateway to information. India is a part of a skewed world. We have hundreds of thousands of people who live on less than $2 a day. The questions are many and diverse. Our challenge is to create 
new centers of excellence that provide equal opportunity and harness the talent of our billion plus people for our shared prosperity. Our challenge also is to build institutions that refresh, renew and strengthen our culture and tradition. India today faces the challenges of equity and expansion of education and health care. Our country's leadership has promised education for all and health care for all. The real challenge is to realize this promise, not on the basis of mediocrity, but on the strong foundations of excellence that can be scaled rapidly. Some of you may be wondering why my passion for education goes so deep. It is because my tryst with education started a long time ago. I have been a teacher for more than 20 years. I have truly believed that inclusion and excellence can indeed go hand in hand. I took great pride in establishing schools at the Reliance site spread all over India. We had to ensure that our employees' children got proper education. Today, over 15,000 children study in these schools. My association with education entered a new phase when I set up the Dhirubhai Ambani International School in Mumbai. We realized that there was a tremendous gap in the schooling system in India. There was an opportunity to set up new standards of education. Starting from scratch, in seven short years, the school's reputation has soared beyond Mumbai to give it a place amongst the top 10 percentile in the world. It has given us the self-confidence that such institutions of excellence can be created in India, and that too in a very short time. Dhirubhai Ambani, the founder of Reliance, would insist that whatever Reliance creates has to be amongst the best, not only nationally, but internationally. At the Dhirubhai Ambani International School, we recognize that each child is special and gifted. We have been modestly successful in creating a robust foundation for our children to grow into creative, compassionate, caring, knowledgeable, and capable human beings. I'm proud to say that it is indeed a world-class center of excellence. I'm truly blessed to work with some amazing teachers every day and also to interact with incredibly talented children who win laurels after laurels, be it in academics, sports, or artistic and cultural activities. Some of these bright minds, such as Abhishek, Arjun, Sukriti, Aditya, Devika, Anushka, are studying at LSE now. Let me also cite a recent example from our school. When Nobel laureate Jean-Marie Leng visited Mumbai, a young girl from our school, Jessica, asked him a question. Sir, you say that molecules are evolving along the paths of self-organization. Doesn't this go against the second law of thermodynamics, which states that entropy in the universe is increasing? Professor Len was amazed at this little girl's brilliance and said that Jessica had asked him one of the most intelligent questions in his life. I naturally felt happy to hear this. Jessica had the courage to question a Nobel laureate. Healthy irreverence is emerging in India. <laughs> Thank you.
Jessica has secured admission in six global universities, including MIT, Princeton, Imperial, and Cambridge. <laughs> I'm mentioning this incident only to emphasize that there are so many more Jessicas in the schools across India, not only in the cities, but in our villages. They too can have a bright future, provided they get the right education and the right to education. Education has to become inclusive and equitable. And this, I believe, is possible. However, for this to happen, India has to introduce and enforce many far-reaching reforms. It pains me to see that music, dance, painting, arts and crafts find very little space of prominence in the conventional education system in India. As an exponent of Bharat Natyam, a classical Indian dance form, and a connoisseur of architecture, I know that including these soft skills are indis indispensable to a student's personality. The change must happen. It will happen. Anna a senior political leader once challenged our school project. He said it would never work. As we were setting ourselves against institutions that were over 100 years old, we proved him wrong. I have never believed in benchmarking. I have always believed in setting new standards of excellence, and this has helped. I'm proud that we have exemplary achievements to substantiate this. It is a challenge to build such institutions of excellence, but we get energized by the promise of their impact in India. Going forward, as India takes on tougher challenges and negotiates new frontiers, it will need hundreds of such institutions of excellence. I have humbly tried to narrate my modest participation in this transformational process, which I have thoroughly enjoyed. Friends, my experience so far in building world-class institutions of excellence has given me the confidence to take the next leap. It has created a platform to springboard to the next cycle of value creation in India. For quite some time, both Mukesh and I have been troubled by another question. Why is it that India, which accounts for one-sixth of the world's population, does not have a single university that finds a place amongst the global top 20? India of antiquity took pride in having Nalanda and Takshila. These centers of Excellence attracted scholars from near and far. But where are the Nalandas and Takshilas in today's India? We, at the newly established Reliance Foundation, took an important decision to set up a world-class university in India. As a humble contribution to the national aspiration to put India on the global educational map, a university that radiates excellence. A university that harnesses not just the best practices, but also the next practices of education. A, u a university that breaks new grounds in the use of technology for education. And above all, a university that looks global, but has an Indian soul. It will emphasize the critical importance of the intersection of disciplines. For it is the intersection of science and liberal arts, of technology and culture, which promises new breakthroughs that will change the way we live. Our university will aspire and endeavor to re-establish India's leadership in the global intellectual area. This is our grand vision, rather an obsessive ambition. Friends, as the world progresses, 
it will continue to build many bridges in its evolution. For peace, for knowledge, for information, and for reconciliation. We are also trying to build a couple of bridges in India through the Reliance Foundation. The bridge to bridge the great chasms and to narrow the divides. The first one is in the area of health care. Starting with a world-class hospital, our goal is to radically influence the way the healthcare industry operates in India. The objective is to bridge the healthcare divide in the country by providing quality and affordable healthcare to all. The second bridge that we are building will meaningfully connect the rural India with the urban area, with the urban India, the forgotten Bharat with the progressive India. Our slogan for this initiative is Bharat India Joro or Beej, meaning connect Bharat and India. India still has a large focus on agriculture, but this sector is slowly eroding. Farmers are becoming diffident about their profession. They are turning to unsustainable options in the urban areas. This is a serious threat to the backbone of India. The Bharat India Jodo initiative aspires to be a game changer. It will integrate entrepreneurship, sustainability and talent. Once a land of plenty has today become barren. Harsh rains have taken away the productive soils, water is depleted and resources are minimal. This is where Salai Kaka lives. With four acres inherited from his father, his land has to support eight lives. My first son suffered from lung disease and passed away young. My daughter-in-law left to work as a migrant worker. Now she sends us money to take care of our grandchildren who do the daily household chores. Taking care of our animals, collecting seeds. How can they go to school? Who will do the work? Health care is also a big problem. The village health centre is mostly closed. One more day ends in the life of Salai Kaka with insufficient funds as he needs another loan for his second son's marriage. The interest rate varies anywhere between 120 to 150 percent. The tenure of loans can be more than one's life. The festive season is round the corner, but Salai Kaka will be forced to leave home again in search of employment. His loans will never be over. The need of the hour is survival and migration is the only hope. This then is a story of marginalization of a farmer's life. Hmm. This is an emotional chain vision. The rules of the game will be rewritten. Not if, but when we do become successful, India will be meaningfully integrated. It will truly be equitable and holistically progressive. Lord Stern, you will be happy to know that in whatever we do at the Reliance Foundation, we try and anchor it around three things, people, planet, and prosperity. Mahatma Gandhi, the father of our nation, has taught us that all of us on this planet are just trustees of the future generations to come. We believe in this principle. The planet will have to be carefully utilized while we take care of the aspirations of our people and in the process share prosperity. We understand that we will have to be compassionate to the people. We will have to be considerate to our planet and we will have to coordinate for prosperity. Friends, 
If America is a land of opportunities, India is a land of ideas. Mukesh always says, India is not a place of a billion problems. India is a place of a billion opportunities. And just imagine what will happen if the power of a billion Indian minds get harnessed. A new India is in the making. A new India that will be built on unique partnerships between the private, public and citizen sectors. This new India seeks global partnerships. Partnerships to address the aspirations of its people. Partnerships with iconic institutions like LSE that have the power to innovate for the future. Recently, at a conference, I was asked a question. Mrs. Ambani, India has witnessed many movements. The Freedom Movement, the Green Revolution Movement, the information technology movement. In your mind, which is the next movement? My answer to him was simple. I said, my friend, India itself is a movement. A movement that will help to rebalance the world. A movement that spreads on the foundations of collaboration. A movement that will be built on the principles of sharing, compassion and passion. A movement that will galvanize the whole world. A movement that will make the world a better place to live in. And you, my young friends, will be the custodians of this movement. The torchbearers of this renewed world order. Friends, I earnestly hope that you will participate in this movement called India. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, of all the th various things you said, I very much chime with your respect for irreverence. Wherever I go to convocation in India, I always tell them, never believe anything anyone older than you says, including myself. <laughs> and if only endeavor to learn the intelligent argumentative irreverence we would be very well off. I have a few questions here, and as I read them, I shall uh, pass them on to you. The first one is uh, very straightforward. What, uh, what are the education reforms you would like to see? Uh, would they be affordable to the common man? You, you go, shall I tell you all three? Yeah. Uh, your thoughts about the two IPL home rusticated, uh, two, uh, two teams rusticated from IPL, Kings Eleven and Rajasthan Royals. Uh, and the third question is rather long. I'll read it and I'll, I'll tell you what it says. Uh, it's something about the uh, uh, idea that um, all our education is a problem because of the, the British who badly advised Jawaharlal Nehru, including PMS Blackett and JBS Holden. Uh, how must we judge what you are trying to do in India? That's the question. Uh, does that mean it's both about education and one about IPL?
to millions of its fans. Um, cricket, as you know, is a religion in India. Uh, for me, I think what Mumbai Indians virtually made the difference was to get our domestic talent. You know, we have a young Saurabh Tiwari who comes from Jharkhand, who was 18 years old when he joined Mumbai Indians. And on this next week, he's going to play for India for the first time at the age of 19. For me, this is inspiring. Uh, we have um, a young Abu um, Nachim, a bowler from Orissa, who is 18 years old and is bowling at the speed of 140 kilometers an hour. And he is going to be chosen by the Indian team in the next 10 months. So for me, these are truly gratifying experiences of my career. Anyway, let me, let me say, I think we've had a very good, very good time listening to you. You've been very inspiring, very creative. And uh, I think we will, we will take away from here uh, the idea that there is an India coming up, which is going to be world beater India. And it is going to be world beater because it is Indians themselves who very much want it to be a world beater. Uh, when I was young, all the all the films used to be tragic, you know, people dying or you know losing losing their lives or their eyes or whatever it is. That was the vision of India of itself in the 1940s. Later on, it became more and more bold. Then it became bitter in the 60s and 70s, frustrated. Then it became very much in, involved in you know uh, um, NRI life and so on. But now I think there's a very different mood. Now there's a mood that now is the time has come to go get to the top. And get to the top taking everybody along with each other. And that I think is the vision you have uh, conveyed to us and we're very grateful to you for that. It is very much a vision that would have pleased uh, President Narayanan uh, and I'm sure it will please uh, 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 the Modi uh, family very much. Anyway. Thank you very much once again, and I, I cede now to uh, Lelot Stern. It's um, my task um, to close the proceedings, and there are one or two things we have to do as we close. Now, the first thing um, is to give you a small gift. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And still more important is to give you our thanks. And um, I speak for Howard Davis, the director of the LSE, and the whole of the LSE, in thanking you for this inspirational talk. Um, as some of you know, I've um, lived and worked in rural India uh, since 1974. And um, the things you described about what's happening in village India, what's happening in agriculture, what's happening in the schools, and sometimes not very much, is uh, was very dear to my heart. And it's uh, your pursuit of excellence, what you demand, what the people of India demand, that will change and is changing what happens to young people in rural schools in India. So thank you so much for that. Thank you for what you said about the planet. One of the uh, problems and joys of being big, and India is big, is what you do is not marginal. What you do matters to us all. It matters because rising living standards in India are fundamental. Poverty anywhere in the world is poverty everywhere in the world. We're parts of the same nation in that sense. But also, of course, India's size means that its effect on the world uh, is enormous, not just the world economy, but uh, the whole world ecosystems and environmental structures. So your focus on that issue is, again, a wonderful thing for us all. Um, your pursuit, we're in an elite institution. We take elite institutions seriously, and your emphasis on excellence is absolutely fundamental. And we look forward very much to collaborating with the Reliance University and uh, it's a very special idea, and we hope that we can help in whatever way that uh, it turns out uh, is possible. So we stand ready.
to be involved or to help in any way. It's a wonderful, wonderful idea. And uh, finally, what you emphasised, above all, it's not just excellence in education, it's values in education. And those values are fundamental. And it, uh, the values involved in how you treat other people, your depth of understanding of the human condition, and your desire to make the world a better place. That's actually, the, that was the uh, motivation behind the founders of the LSC. Uh, as you say in your country, it is our duty, and it is our duty to use what we have, particularly the education that we have, to make the world a better place. And that was very deep, very deep in the values of what you were saying today, and that's of fundamental importance. And it's those values which um, Mr. and Mrs. Modi, Champa Ben and Jamna thus have brought to the world, brought to their family. I've had the privilege of being in your home and uh, at Diwali time. It was a very special privilege. And I've had the opportunity of seeing at first hand the values that you bring to the world and the values that you've taught us all about. So I think your emphasis on values, Nita, was so much in accord with the people that we honour today, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Modi. So I'd like you to thank Mr. and Mrs. Modi for being with us today. So, and thank you again, uh, High Commissioner Surita, for being with us. It's a great honour. You come here a lot, and we value that very much. And thank you for being, again, for being with us today. So, thank you all for coming, and above all, thank you, Nita, for a really inspirational evening. Thank you so much. <laughs>